Next up, in his years as governor, Charlie Baker has yet to commute a single prison sentence. And so far, the state parole board has only held two clemency hearings. One this past January, in which they unanimously recommended to downgrade the first-degree murder conviction of a former Marine, Thomas Kuntz, so that he's immediately eligible for parole. He's still awaiting a final decision from the governor. And the board held its second hearing last week for William Allen. Allen and his friend Rolando Perry went to the Brockton home of a man named Purvis Bester one night in January 94, both armed with knives. They were planning to rob him, but when they got there, Perry stabbed Bester several times, killing him. They were arrested shortly after, and even though Allen had been in another room and did not participate in the fatal stabbing, they were both charged with murder. Perry pled guilty to second-degree murder charges and was released on parole more than a decade ago. But Allen refused the plea deal and was ultimately convicted of first-degree murder under existing law at the time and received a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. He was 20 years old then. He's now 47, having spent more than half his life in prison. But now, for the first time in nearly three decades, he's got a real chance of getting out with advocacy organizations and several prominent figures, including the Patriots' Devin McCourty, urging the state to commute his sentence. And in last week's hearing, William Allen told the board, I am not asking you to forget what I've done. I just want you to know that's not who I am today. And if I'm given the chance at freedom, I want to make good footprints for children of color to follow because I don't want them to follow the same footprints I did. Next, the parole board will make their recommendation. If they approve, the next vote is Governor Baker's. I'm joined now by one of Allen's staunchest advocates and his co-counsel, former Supreme Judicial Court Justice Robert Cordy, who's also chief legal counsel to Governor Bill Weld in the early 90s. Justice Cordy, it's good to see you. Thanks for being here. Happy to be here. Why does William Allen deserve release? Well, I must say, about 15 months ago, his uh, lawyers at the time, uh, Kristen McDonald and uh, Patty DeJunis, came to me and said, we'd like you to look at this petition and see what you think, and maybe you'll join us. I looked at it very carefully, and I was blown away. It was the most compelling commutation petition I'd ever seen. This man, in 27 years, had completely remade his life. He had become generous, kind to a fault, taken advantage of every prison program offered, even got, even requested that he be moved to another prison so he could take more programs, had become a companion prisoner, uh, working with other prisoners with mental health issues, and everyone just really fell in love with him for all the right reasons. The, and, my and understanding is also, in a, in a very odd circumstance, the prosecutor's office, the prosecutor supports the commutation, as does most of the victim's family. Is race part of the consideration you're putting before the board, Justice Corda? We're not putting that before the board, but if you look at the Massachusetts prison system, uh, it is um, highly populated, particularly the life lifers with uh, black people. Uh, no, but, but no, that's not a factor here. Uh, what's a factor is what he's done for himself and uh, how he's remade himself and done everything humanly possible to become eligible to return to the community. And as you pointed out, the community is very supportive of him coming back. Um, and of course, as you also pointed out, the, the one who persuaded him to be involved in the robbery and who actually killed Mr. Bester, of course, um, has been paroled 10 or 12 years ago. I want to return to that issue in a second, but I want to talk about something else that, to talk about and see if you see it as relevant. As you know, the law was changed in 2017 by the SJC. You were long gone, well, gone yes. by then anyway, where they determined essentially that it, unless there's prior intent, which no one is arguing in the case of Mr. Allen right. uh, when he went to this person's uh, location, unless there's prior intent, you can't, uh, uh, first degree murder is off the table. Even though the law was not retroactive, is that not relevant to the consideration of a parole board? 
Well, I think it should be relevant, but um, the most important thing is who he has become. The circumstances, both the fact that he's serving life without the possibility of parole because he was too young and not able to accept responsibility then, he has now, um, and the fact that the law has changed and he couldn't even be prosecuted or convicted today of first-degree felony murder, I think is very relevant. And I think the district attorney uh, notably recognized that in, in his... Uh, in his remarks to the uh, the Board of Pardons. You know, uh, Justice Cordy, uh, knowing that I was going to have you here, I decided that I would pretend I was a former justice of the SJC and do what you guys do for guys and women do for a living, which is ask, ask tough questions, even if you don't agree with the underlying premise in the question. So let me give it a try. I was trying to come up with one good argument as to why William Allen should not be released after spending more than half of his life in jail for all the reasons that you've mentioned in the last couple of minutes. Can you make an argument for the other side here? No. And it's so remarkable. That's an honest question. A man of few words. Go. It's <laughs> remarkable that the district attorney himself came and said, this is a worthy case. You know, can we step back for a second? I want to put some numbers up, and they're approximate. We looked at some work reporting that WBUR and The Globe had done. There have been somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 to 300 clemency requests under, uh, while well, Governor Baker's been there. Uh, that's approximate. These f next numbers are precise. Two hearings total, zero uh, uh, commutations so far. Maybe Mr. Kuntz will get one. We hope Mr. Allen gets one. Why is this? Why, why is there so little time spent on considering whether men and women have changed their lives and deserve freedom? I don't know why, but it shouldn't be that way. I mean, if you look at Governor Baker's clemency guidelines, they point out very importantly the commutations are to serve as a motivation for confined persons to utilize all the resources for mm. self-development and self-improvement as an incentive for them to re return as law-abiding citizens. But if there are no hearings and no consideration, then that incentive is gone. So I would hope that these two cases, Kuntz and Allen, uh, will break the ice and I think we'll point yeah. out how these things can be important and well done. I re you wrote a piece in The Globe about this in July of last year, and I think the number you cited was the request for a hearing had been filed three and a half years before. Am I right about that, that as we're sitting here, for four, it's been four and a half years since Mr. Allen has requested uh, uh, commutation th through the state? Uh, yes. Is that right? Right. Not unusual. You know, one function. of the things... Not unusual. Well, at least he's getting a hearing, which is unusual, yeah. unfortunately. Oh. Why, you broached something before that, that I'd like to spend maybe 60 seconds on. Uh, the guy who actually was the killer uh, pled guilty and mm -hmm. is out, as I said, and as you said, roughly a decade ago. A guy who chose to go to trial, your client, uh, could mm -hmm. spend the rest of his life in, in jail. Isn't there a fundamental unfairness in that, even if Mr. Allen hadn't reformed himself, even if all the other objective conditions you've mentioned were not that, how is it ever equitable that the man or woman who does the crime is free and the man or woman who was, and I'm using the term loosely, it was an accomplice and not the committer of the act spends his or her life in jail? I just don't get it. Well, I think the SJC, as you pointed out, has recently modified the first degree felony murder to try to reduce that level of unfairness for sure. But, you know, Mr. Allen was a young man, couldn't come to grips with the fact that the law then made him as culpable because he yeah. was an accomplice yeah. in the felony. And does it make any sense looking back on it? In this case, no. But uh, hopefully the commutation process will help right the wrong.
or right the injustice. Do you have any idea? Do you have any idea when Mr. Allen will hear what the outcome, what the decision of the parole board is? And then, as I said earlier, would have to even if he got approval, it has to go to the governor and then the governor's council. Do you have any idea what the timetable is? Uh, I don't. I would assume it would be a couple of months before we would hear. Uh, the parole board is unfortunately very busy doing the parole side of their business. And the commutation, the clemency side, has really been neglected. And it needs more resources because the clemency side is equally as important. Justice Cordy, I wish you luck. It's good to see you. Please Thank stay you. in touch with us and send Mr. Allen our best. Thank you Thanks very much, Jim.